Good morning, everybody. I hope you had a, a good morning so far. I hope you've had a good week. If you haven't, I'm sorry, but the good thing is we get to start a new one today. So we can kind of put the things from last week behind us and kind of move forward. Um, it's funny because the more I'm talking to people in different parts of the globe, it seems like everybody seems to be dealing with a lot of storms right now. And when we're in the midst of storms and a lot of seeming chaos, if we just look at the circumstances, we can tend to forget who to focus our hearts on. Uh, but this week I've actually been studying in the book of Exodus for our youth, because that's what we're going through, and uh, going through the tabernacle. And as you go through the tabernacle, you can't help but get refocused on what God's plan was all along, and that was Jesus. And when Jesus is the focus and the center point of our hearts, we remember that he's the anchor. We remember that he can calm the storms and that he is in control of everything. And in fact, we serve a God that is not only wonderful, but he does wonders as well. So we're going to sing that song in a second, God of Wonders. But before we begin, let's just start with a word of prayer together. Lord, we just thank you, Lord, that you are in control. Lord, in the midst of chaos and storms, Lord, we know we can run to you and that you are the anchor that holds fast. Lord, we pray for those brothers and sisters in our church family that have been struggling and going through different times of loss or heartache or just, just storms of circumstances in the moment. Lord, help us to remember to focus on you. Lord, help us to remember, Lord, that you say you want to give us life to the full. But in this fallen world, we will deal with the storms. We will deal with dark valleys. Lord, in you we can find rest even in those places. So Lord, help us to focus our hearts on you. Lord, as we sing together as a church family, Lord, we pray that you would prepare our hearts and focus our hearts for what we're going to be hearing from Chris in a little bit. Lord, we pray that you would give him the words to say. In Jesus' name. Let's go ahead and stand and sing together the song that says, God of Wonders. <clears throat>
thank you, Lord, that whatever goes on in our lives and around us, Lord, we know this, that you are Lord of heaven and earth. The Lord of our lives, Lord, our every breath is at your command. The hairs on our head are numbered. Our days are written in your book. You know the end from the beginning. You are the sovereign one. And you reign from on high. And Lord, I thank you, you are the God of the details. Mm. And you know us from afar. Yeah. And you know the good things that you've got in store for us. Mm. And I, help, I pray you give us the grace to, to fix our eyes on Jesus, to look forward and to not look behind. And uh, fill our lives with faith and your precious Holy Spirit. Mm. Thank you, dear God, for your great love for us and for your faithfulness. Thank you in Jesus' name. Despite all that is happening in our lives, happening in our world, you are not unmindful of them. And that is why we have this assurance that we can cast all our burdens upon you because you care for us. And no matter what situation anyone, you know, in, in the family, you know, here and anywhere in the world that's going through at this moment, we ask of God that, you know, you will touch everyone with your own hand of comfort. And as we gather here today, we ask, oh God, that uh, we hear that one word that will lift us up and be, make us who you want us to be. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's go ahead and sing our next song together.
Uh, it's going to be on the screen, but if you want to open up in your apps or your Bibles to where you can be there for when Chris comes up. Uh, we're looking at John chapter 10, verses 22 to 42 today, where it says this. Then came the festival of dedication at Jerusalem. It was winter, and Jesus was in the temple courts walking in Solomon's colonnade. The Jews who were there gathered around him, saying, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Messiah, tell us plainly. Jesus answered, I did tell you, but you, did not, you do not believe. The works I do in my Father's name testify about me, but you do not believe because you are not my sheep. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. Again, his Jewish opponents picked up stones to stone him, but Jesus said to them, I have shown you many good works from the Father. For which one of these do you stone me? We are not stoning you for any good work, they replied, but for blasphemy, because you, a mere man, claim to be God. Jesus answered them, It is not written in your it, sorry, is it not written in your law? I have said you are gods. If he called them gods to whom the word of God came, and scripture cannot be set aside. What about the one whom the Father set apart as his very own and sent into the world? Why then do you accuse me of blasphemy because I said, I am God's son? Do you not believe me unless I do the works of my Father? But if I do them, even though you do not believe me, believe the works that you may know and understand that the Father is in me and I am in the Father. Again, they tried to seize him, but he escaped their grasp. Then Jesus went back across the Jordan to the place where John had been baptizing in the early days. There he stayed. And many people came to him. They said, though John never performed a sign, all that John said about this man was true. And in that place, many believed in Jesus. You know, there's nothing that Jesus ever says that was false. And he makes it plain. And every time he makes it plain, it just seems like they keep on trying to deny Claim. So there's always an excuse why not. But see, we are called not only to follow him, but we are called to worship the one who was sent by the Father. So before Chris comes up, we're going to sing the song, Here I Am to Worship. And understand this, worship is not just singing. A lot of times because of our modern vocabulary, we think of worship as singing. Worshiping is obeying. Worshiping is following. Worshiping is seeking. Worshiping is also listening intently to see that God would point out to us what we should do with what we've heard. So as we prepare our hearts, let us think as we sing this next song, what is it that we can learn from this? What is this that we, that we can apply? And how does that affect our witness to others? As we're singing this song, towards the end of the song, the kids can go ahead and go out. Sarah's going to be leaving the class today. So towards the end of the song, all the kids are excused. Let's go ahead and stand together now and sing the song, Here I Am to Worship, and then Chris is going to come.
once again for your word. We thank you that you are in control. We thank you that you are worthy of praise. Lord, you are the only one that is. Lord, as we hear the words that you put on Chris's heart through his study this week, Lord, we just pray that you would help us to see what it is we can apply, what it is we can do in response. Lord, we thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Way to life. We're continuing in John. Um, you might find it helpful to have your Bibles, but we're going to try and go through verse by verse, um, depending on the time we see if that's possible to literally cover every single verse. But I wanted to start actually at the end, verse 42. And in that place, many believed in Jesus. So... That is basically what the passage is, is really all about. It's about belief in Jesus and how essential it is, how needed it is. And it's contrasted here that these people at the end of the passage believed in Jesus because throughout the passage the contrast is there are those who don't and there are those in fact who, who won't. And surprisingly, in some ways, it's, it's the religious people. Uh, so often when John talks about the Jews coming to Jesus to talk to him, he's actually meaning the representatives, if you like, of the Jews, which is the religious leaders, sometimes the Pharisees and other religious people. And the passage starts with um, them coming to Jesus while he's walking in the temple courts in Solomon's colonnade. And we're told some details here. They, this, this happened at the festival of dedication at Jerusalem. It was appropriate for Jesus to be there at this time because the feast or the festival of dedication was all about the temple. So what better place to be than walking around the temple and in the temple courts. The festival of dedication, um, probably known more familiarly today as Hanukkah, is when they celebrated the, the, the liberation and the restoration of the temple. Uh, after, and this was, this was um, not, not that long before Christ, but um, when Antiochus Epiphanes um, wanted to bring kind of Greek, Greek culture to, to Israel, but also Greek religion, and he kind of took over the land, um, following in the footsteps of um, other, other conquerors, wanting to take over many different nations. But he had no respect and almost wanted to insult the Jews and their God by placing in the temple, the Jewish temple, the altar of Zeus and even allowing pig sacrifice. And so you may know Judas Maccabeus, heard of him. Um, he sort of led a revolt uh, or revolution to liberate them again from these occupiers, but also to restore the temple to its former worship. And, um, and he did that. And, uh, and so this festival, which people still remember today, is remembering that the temple was restored. But, but not everybody's celebrating fully. It's a celebration and still is a, 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 a great celebration. It happens around the same time as Christmas. So even there we're told it was winter. But not everyone was fully happy with things because now the Romans were occupying the land and although they had a bit more respect in terms of allowing them to exercise their religion and the temple was still being used in the way it should be used, um, they were still wanting and waiting and hoping for a Messiah to come and liberate them from the Romans, a kind of political, if you like, Messiah, or even a, a military Messiah even. And so they come to Jesus and they say, how long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Messiah, tell us plainly. So Jesus had been very careful not to go around saying to them, I'm the Messiah. Um, he was quite happy to say that to a Samaritan woman, uh, or well, we, we, could, we could read that about that in John chapter 4, because she, she fully, her understanding was spiritual. She was looking for a saviour, a spiritual messiah. But he understood that these guys were looking for a political, military, military messiah, and so he wouldn't use that terminology. However, Jesus had been showing again and again and saying again and again who he really is by by, yes, his words, uh, but also by his actions. Even in John chapter 10, um, he's, he's basically said who he is. 
uh, earlier on. He's basically likened himself to the to the, the the shepherd figure in Psalm 23, which is clearly and obviously and plainly, undeniably God. So he's already even a couple of months before this encounter and this conversation made it very clear that, that he's claiming to be God, the Son of God, the Messiah, the Saviour. Come, I did tell you. Jesus says in verse 25, but you do not believe. So these guys are asking him a question, and at first it seems like they genuinely want to know the answer, but Jesus knows their hearts. You do not believe, you do not want to believe, you do not accept my testimony. And it's not just that his testimony, you know, I mean, there are religions in the world, aren't there, today, where just one person has said, God's told me, and angels told me, and it's just their word. But Jesus is saying here, but, but look at the works. The works I do in my Father's name testify about me. So I'm, I'm saying stuff, but I'm showing it, I'm proving it to you by what I do. It's obvious. And just in the book of John alone, we have so many what John calls signs. So um, they're the word works. In John, when he uses the word works, he's talking about miracles, he's talking about signs, uh, things that um, show clearly that God is at work. And we've seen various things. We've also seen Jesus claim uh, to be God and the Son of God various times in different ways, even without saying, I am the Messiah. So chapter two, we've got water turned into wine. We've got John the Baptist, saying this is the Messiah, this is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. We've had a healing of someone from a distance. Uh, now John is very selective, as we've already seen, Johnny just chose a few key things, but we also have the old the other Gospels that tell us about multiple healings. Sometimes it just says, Jesus healed many. It doesn't even go into detail. So these guys have seen this and heard this, and John has been showing us through all these chapters that we've looked at already, uh, both by the signs, the miracles, and by what Jesus has said about himself, that he's declaring himself to be God. He's declaring himself to be sent from God, come from God to be saviour, to bring us to the Father. And um, even as we have said in chapter 10 itself, when he talks about being the good shepherd, he's making it clear that he fulfills that psalm, that he is the one who we are to trust in and look to, just as we're to look to God and trust in him. So why do these not believe? Why do they not believe um, in both what he's saying, which he ticks the boxes of the Old Testament prophecies, he fulfills the scriptures, um, but also his works testify to the fact that he, he is of God, he's from God and he is God. Well, you're not my sheep, he says. You're not my sheep. So as we said at the beginning, this passage is about belief in Jesus, how essential it is. And basically he's saying, you might be religious, you might know the Bible, you might go to church as it were, but you're not my sheep. The only way you can belong to God, the only way you can belong to God's family, God's people, is through belief in Jesus. You're not my sheep. That's why you don't believe. Believing in Jesus is... Uh, the key to being part of his fold, his flock, his family. If you don't believe in Jesus, he's saying you don't belong. And John has been dealing with this a number of times. He's kind of been contrasting this from the very first chapter that, you know, you could go, you could be born into the nation of Israel or you could be born into a, a, a Christian family, but it doesn't make you part of God's family until you trust and believe in Jesus. Chapter 1 he says he came, he came for his own, the Jewish people, but his own rejected him. And he gave the right to anybody and everybody who believes in him to be a child of God. So this is consistent throughout John, that you know, being, being born into a family or into a nation, going to church, knowing the Bible, that isn't the key. To, you need to know God personally, and that's only possible through Jesus Christ. And once someone has believed in Jesus Christ, they evidence it, or it's seen in the fact that they listen to his voice. Um, I know them and they follow me. So those who are truly belonging to God uh, follow Jesus. They follow his teaching, they follow his example, they trust in him, they look to him. 
uh, in everyday life because of what he's already provided for them, because he provides them with what no one and nothing can. Verse 28, I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. Those who put their trust in Jesus Christ, God, God is with them. God is in them. And it says here that they cannot lose that which they've received. Life, verse 10 of chapter 10 says life to the full. And here we hear about eternal life. Um, no one and nothing can snatch them out of my hands, says Jesus. So if you're, if you're a believer in Jesus, if you put your trust in Jesus, then you are safe. And you're saved and you're safe. You're, you're safe and you're saved forever. Uh, and, and that, it, it, last week we talked about sheep and how sheep do wonder and do crazy silly things and get lost and all that sort of stuff. And even though we may wonder at times, that though we, we may fail, though we may fall, though we may come under attack and be hurt and harmed, there is one who, who gets us back on track. There's one who will not let us go who goes looking for us when we wander, who picks us up when we fall, who nurses and heals us when we're harmed. Um, that's the experience of the person who believes in Jesus. It is the experience that Psalm 23 talks about. The Lord is my shepherd, I, I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right path for his namesake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they come for me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely your goodness and mercy or love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That is the experience of a person who's believing, who's trusting, who has faith in, is following Jesus. They will know God's provision and God's protection and God's comfort. Goodness and mercy will follow them all the days of this life. And they will pass, yes, through the valley of the shadow of death, but they're not to fear any evil because he's still with them and he's going to take them to be with him forever. And they dwell in the house of God forever. Jesus is saying, if you want that, if, if that's to be your experience, all you need to do is believe in him and trust in him and follow him. And if you have already, then he assures us, doesn't he, in those verses, um, sorry, no one will snatch them out of my hand. No one. So, so even when life is hard and we find ourselves maybe separated from, from loved ones through bereavement or through displacement or even through divorce, um, we, can, we will never be separated from God. He will continue to be with us, no matter what. We might find ourselves separated from wealth and financial security for a time in our lives, but we're not separated from the promise that he will provide what we need. We can find ourselves even separated from good health, but we can experience and know in our hearts the peace and the calm and the presence of God. He's promised that he will be with us. So, so whatever we face, um, there's no mountain high enough. There's no valley deep enough to keep his love, keep him from us. Which is kind of what Romans says. Um, Romans chapter 8. It says, what should we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us. How will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things, goodness and mercy, will follow us the rest of the days of our life, and we will then dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So, so what's going to separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we will we face death all day long. We are considered a sheep to be slaughtered, so we will face trouble, we will face opposition. We Jesus is facing opposition, so as his people, we're likely to too. Persecution in all kinds of forms. But in all things, we are still more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I'm convinced that neither life nor death, neither angels nor demons, nor the present, 
nor the future, and then it continues, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So if we believe in Jesus, if we're in Christ Jesus, it's a term that Paul uses a lot in his, his, his writings, in Jesus, in Christ. If we're in Christ, then we cannot be separated from the love of God. Jesus has said, um, no one can snatch them out of my hands. And now to sort of make it doubly clear, he goes on to say, no one can snatch us from the Father's hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. You know, I take my word for it. If you, if, if you trust in me, then you're safe and you're saved. But if you have any doubts, my Father, who is greater than all, so even if you don't, even though Jesus is saying he's God, but he's being patient with these guys and saying, but even if you don't understand that I'm God, understand this, God the Father, who everyone understands to be all-powerful, he will not, no one can snatch you out of his hands because no one is greater than him as we've sung today. Our God is greater. There is no one greater. And so be assured that if God is for us, as Romans 8 says, no one can be against us. And nothing can separate us from his love. And such is his love that you can you can understand this scripture slightly differently. There's, there's different translations of it um, out there. Um, and it can be read this way. What my father has given to me is greater than all. So the reading we have there is saying God is greater than all. Therefore, nothing can come between us. But what other translations say um, is what my Father has given to me is greater than all. Basically saying to Jesus, we're the greatest thing. We're the most precious thing. We're the most important thing. So, so he's not going to let us go. If you've put your trust in him and you're part of his fold, you're part of his flock, you're part of his family, he's going to fight for you. He's not going to let you go. We, to him, are the greatest thing of all. Either version, either understanding of that scripture still assures us in the same way that because of who God is and because of how he views us, either way, he's not going to let us go. No one and nothing can separate us or snatch us from his hand. So, so these scriptures are teaching us something that some, some theologians call eternal security or, or perseverance of the saints. It means that once you've put your trust in Jesus, once you've you're saved. You're always saved. He's, he's rescued you. You can't be snatched again. You were, you were lost, now you're found. You won't be lost again. You were dead, he made you alive. You're not going to go back to being dead again. You're alive in him, and that's the way it is. He's adopted you into his family, and he's not going to disown you. That remains consistent for now and forever. And he can promise that because he is God. And that is what this passage is about. It's about the conflict between Jesus clearly saying and declaring and showing that he is God. And the Jewish leaders don't like it and don't believe it. And if there's any doubt that that's what he's saying, verse 30, I and the Father are one. So these verses are very comforting and reassuring and, um, and yet at the same time they fulfil a purpose to show us that Jesus is God and Again, he wants to be clear. I and the Father are one. If you're in any, any doubt about what I'm saying, here it is. Um, Jesus is just declaring himself equal with, with God and in partnership with God and sharing in the purposes of God. Yes, there are distinct persons, but the same, uh, the same essence and the same purpose. And there in verse 38, again, he says it again. Um, I want you to understand that the Father is in me. And I am in the Father, we are, we are one. I am God. And that's where you can trust me. And that's what the works indicate. But even as he says that, then they pick up stones to stone him. They understand now fully, you've said it. You're making it very clear that you claim to be God. And for blasphemy, they, they, they wanted to, to, to kill him based on the fact that they didn't believe his words. Um, but this reveals their motive all along. 
Jesus has made it plain to them. He's put forward a good argument. Look at my works and listen to what I've said. And I've shown you by what I do that I am God. But this shows their heart, doesn't it? That they don't want to believe. They will not believe. They refuse to believe. Back in verse 24, when it says that they gathered around him, it's almost like they cornered him. He's in the temple courts in the colonnade. And um, the word they're gathered can be translated surrounded. It's used elsewhere about armies surrounding their enemies. And so, the, the, again, that's an indication of what their intention was anyway, to trip him up, to trap him, to kill him. And this is the way they have been all along. So we saw that in, verse, in chapter 5. But when Jesus claimed to be God and when he healed on the Sabbath, they wanted to, to kill him then and they have been ever since. Um, but Jesus continues to argue with them or continues to reason with them even. He continues to be patient with them. At this point, he could have just walked away. And, but, but in his love and his mercy, even his enemies, which the Bible says we once were that, he shows mercy and compassion and patience. And um, so yet again, he appeals to them. For the works that the Father has given me to finish, the very works that I'm doing, they testify that the Father has sent me. He wants them to, to reflect and see and think logically um, that this is, and it's again here, sorry, that was John 5, but John 10 is the same thing. I've shown you many good works from the Father. I've shown you. So which one of these are you stoning me for? And when he says good works, the word they're good can be morally good, as in this is the right thing to do. This is the just thing to do to help people. To, to heal the blind man is what he, I think the last one that John mentions. But to, to help the oppressed and to help the poor. This is a good thing to do. And also that word good can be translated a beautiful thing to do. This is a blessing. So which one of these beautiful blessings and which of these acts of kindness are you going to stone me for? It's crazy, isn't it? He's almost saying, what kind of religion or what kind of God wants to kill people for doing good? And the good that I do is so obviously from God. Who can do these things? Who has done these things? No one in the whole of history has healed and helped people like Jesus. Well, they continue to say, we're not stoning you for any good work, but for this, what they view as blasphemy, to, to, to claim to be God. So it's very clear now what they want to kill Jesus for and what Jesus did end up dying for because of his claim to be God. And Jesus has made it very clear that is what he's claiming. Jesus now appeals to them again, and it's a very complicated few verses, maybe the most, some of the most complicated or debated in, in the scripture. So what we've looked at today is quite simple, isn't it? Jesus is claiming to be God, believe in me, and you'll be saved. But these verses, if all that is as clear as day, these may be as clear as mud. Um, I'm not sure how you read them and what you think of them. But... Just trying to, to sum things up as quick as possible, really. These verses, this phrase, it, is, is it not written, I have said you are gods? It comes from Psalm 82, verse 6, which is about how Israel should have, and God wanted them to, do good works, to, to, do, to look after the poor and the orphan and uh, ensure that people were helped. And in doing so, those who are his people point to God. They show who God is and what God is like. So, so really, this uh, notice there it says, to whom the word of God came. So this is basically, most scholars agree that basically this is about God saying to the Jewish nation, once they received the law, you are to be to the world, me. You are to represent me to the world. So in, in, in the Old Testament, he says that you're to be a light to the na nations. You're to be uh, an example to the nations of who I am. So we're today called Christians, which actually means little Christs. So we're to be ambassadors, we're to be representatives of Jesus. We're to show to the world Jesus, and that was the same for Israel. They were to show God to the world. So he calls them gods with a very small g. Um, you're to be little representations of me to the world, to the nations. And Jesus is saying here, did Israel do a good job of that? They look at their history and they... They, they will know that they, at times maybe, but most of the time not. They haven't really represented God that well to the nations. And yet God calls them God with a small g. But here I am doing these incredible works that no one has ever done. 
And you're bothered that I'm saying I am the son of God and I am God, but it should be obvious to you. And so he's making a claim there that it's, it should be evident who he is from what he does. But also, he's also saying to them, you know, scripture cannot be set aside. Uh, you have to accept what the scriptures say. And, oh there, sorry, at the end, verse 35. The scriptures cannot be set aside. Uh, I think here he's saying as well, it's, it should be obvious to you, the Jewish leaders who supposedly know the Bible, that I do tick the boxes about the Messiah. I do show by what I'm doing and what I say that I am who I say I am. You can't pick and choose the Bible, which bits you like and which bits you don't. You have to believe God's word. And again at this, they still try to seize him. They still want to kill him. They still reject him and what he is saying. Somehow, um, even as this second attempt to get him, he escaped their grasp. Uh, it says in the scripture sometimes, his time had not yet come. And so maybe miraculously, he, he did get away. And the next verses tell us where he went after this. He headed back to where everything started, really. Um, where John was telling people about Jesus, where John was preparing the way for Jesus. And what was John's message? The Messiah's coming. John's message was the Messiah's coming, believe in him, follow him. And, um, and when Jesus did come, John said, there he is. Behold, the Lamb of God, he takes away the sins of the world. Follow him. He said, he must become greater. I must become less. I'm not even worthy to tie his sandals. John pointed to Jesus, and now Jesus goes back to those people who lived in that area, across the Jordan, away from it all, in the sticks, if you like, just normal people, not religious people, away from the religious center of the temple. And as he goes back to them, and he continues to, to share with them, they remember what John had said. They have heard, like everybody probably has by now, that Jesus has done all these miracles and they're like, yeah, John didn't do any of that stuff. John was considered the greatest of all prophets, but he didn't do any signs, he didn't do any works, he didn't do any miracles, but Jesus has done all this stuff. So John's witness was that Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus' works show he was the Messiah. And even though these Jewish leaders have the word of God and don't believe it, these people who are just normal people know enough of the word of God to know that Jesus ticks the boxes in terms of the prophecies and the word. And so through the witness of John, the works of Jesus, the words of scripture, but also the words of Jesus, we can be in no doubt that he is God and he is the way to God and he is the way to life. Both life to the full, John 10, 10, goodness and mercy can follow us all the days of our life and the way to eternal life, which is what he promises to all who believe in him. So to encounter God, to experience and enjoy life to its fullness and God's mercy and grace throughout this life and to experience eternal life, then quite clearly from this passage and the rest of John, Jesus is the way to life. And that doesn't mean we're not going to have hardships or struggles, um, but Jesus has promised that when we do and if we do, um, if we put our trust in him, if we're depending on him and we're believing in him, then when we face difficulties, when we might be bruised and maybe battered, Jesus has promised that he will remain with us. He will never let us go. We will not be overcome because once we've been saved, we're always saved. And once we're safe in his arms, he remains with us and promises to, to the very end of age. So even trusting in Jesus, we may face still difficulties, doubts, depression, even sometimes feel despair. But Jesus said, you'll never perish. And no one will snatch you from my hands. Goodness and mercy will remain with you and follow you every day of your life. And then you'll be with me forever. Jesus, as he says, is the way to life. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for what Jesus offers. And we 
praise you that what he offers is possible because of who he is. And thank you that he's made it plain and clear, and you have made it plain and clear through your word, who Jesus is and what difference he can make. Help us to trust in him and help us to continue to trust in him, no matter what we pray in Jesus' name. We're going to sing now a song that's an old song, but it's the first time we're ever going to sing it here. It's called Never Once Will We Ever Walk Along. So let's go ahead and stand and sing that, and then we'll have a few notices as we finish up. opportunities. We have a 2 p.m. group that meets in the afternoon and then we have two groups at night, one in person, one online. 
Um, this last week we had a first, we had someone joining from a car, from a train, and then people at home all at the same time. And it worked. So it just shows you we have these different chances and opportunities. Uh, we come on Sunday mornings, we hear God's word preached, we sing together and everything. But Wednesdays gives us a chance to really get into God's word together, sharpen with each other, discuss things. Uh, and it just helps us grow individually and as a, as a church family as well. Uh, if, you're, if you're new and you want to be on our WhatsApp group, that's how you find out and get the links uh, for the growth group and everything. And it also helps you kind of stay up to date. Sometimes there's notices that we send out. Sometimes people put prayer requests or songs or verses that encourage them. So it's a great way to get in touch and stay in touch with us. So if you want to be a part of that, please talk to Jeff or Chris or Austin or myself, and we can get you guys on there. And next Saturday, we have our men's study. It's our, our third study so far. Uh, if you sit there and say, well, I've missed the first two or I've missed one of the two, that's okay. We'd still love for you to come uh, jump in and kind of be able to, to do this. We've, we've had a, the best kind of start to a men's ministry we've had in quite some time. So we're encouraged by that. Um, but this next Saturday morning, nine o'clock, we'll be from about nine to 10, 15, 10, 30, it depends on how much discussion we're having and everything. But we'll have some, some pastries, we'll have some coffee and just a chance to be able to sit and study together, right? Um, we hope you guys, oh, no, there's one thing I'm forgetting. Church Week in a way, uh, we have it coming up. If you haven't signed up, give it a chance. We can't tell you exactly how it's going to be because, face it, this is the first time we've done it, but I know it's going to be a good time. Why? Because we're going to make it a good time. And we're going to have a chance to sit down and, and, and chat, talk, get to know each other better, it's not all programmed. We do have downtimes and stuff like that. Um, but the whole point is us being able to get away as a church family, enjoy time, spend time. Uh, you'd be surprised the kind of friendships and relationships that start on weekends like this. Um, and it's a wonderful thing. So it's a 25 pound deposit. Uh, we need to have 50 just to be able to cover everything, but there's space for up to 75. <clears throat> Wouldn't it be a good thing to, to not have any spaces left? I, I think that would probably be the best way forward because that way it means we got almost the whole church being able to go. Um, if there's any things that you, you need to discuss about it or questions, please come and talk to one of us and we'll be able to chat with you about it. All right? Thank you so much for being with us this morning. We look forward to seeing everybody either Wednesday or, or next Sunday.